Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Manic Expression, the Comic Book Cast, the Reopen Nickelodeon Studios and Orlando, Florida Facebook page, the PlayStation Let's Play channel, and for entertainment's sake. <laughs> to this week's episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia and I am here with a very special guest. You may know him from, geez, a lot of things. Uh, he's the co-founder of Starship Amazing, Space Money, Octagon, Stop Skeletons, and you may know him maybe with this one little name, the HVGN or Happy Video Game Nerd, I don't know. But I am here with none other than Derek Alexander. Derek, welcome to Casual Chats. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Seeing as you're like this really busy guy and you're very diverse with all of your talents and all that stuff, where did you get your influences from both music and games? I've always liked music. It's always been a part of my life. My, my dad played guitar. My parents really liked music, so I was always kind of surrounded by it. And uh, I don't know, it's something that it's always really kind of come naturally to me. Uh, I, I didn't enjoy school very much, but I always really loved uh, art and music class and uh, you know, I struggled with reading when I was younger, uh, so kind of music was one thing that just always made sense to me. It was one thing that always came easy to me, but like the rest of school was always such a pain. Uh, so that was just, it's been always a part of me. I, I really, it's just like a, it's a kind of a cheesy answer, but that's, it's a very basic uh, thing. Uh, but for video games, you know, I had, I had an older brother, I have an older brother, <laughs> I still do. <laughs> Um, and he really liked games, uh, and he's six years older than me, and it kind of basically just kind of, you you know, you emulate and you look up to your older siblings, so I think that's kind of where that came from. Like, I don't know why I kind of kept with gaming. It's just been uh, always a really interesting uh, medium of entertainment, and I used to have kind of equal love for film and music, and uh, kind of one thing about video games that's always been really interesting to me is how I'm kind of, I'm almost as old as video games when they became really popular mm -hmm. and really kind of mainstream, because I was born in 84, so uh, that was right around the time of the crash, and then, you know, I was a perfect age for the Nintendo to come out, and so I've, I've kind of grown up with games, and that, that's really interesting to be able to look at an entire medium in just a couple of decades and really have that knowledge, and I, I guess I like, I like history, I like stories. I kind of like watching progression, and so it was just a lucky coincidence that I've been able to watch this medium grow and change and shift. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the way that um, you know, music and games and pretty much anything that has hit the mainstream culture, it always constantly changes, yet at some points it always remains the same. It always gravitates to somebody at least in one aspect or another. Now, uh, I believe that you started Starship Amazing before that you started doing reviews? Yeah, I, I had the idea for the Happy Video Game Nerd. Um, I kind of sat on that idea for a good like six, seven months because I'd never done any film or anything like that. I was just kind of studying music and playing guitar and kind of thought that, you know, I wanted to be a creative person and I wanted to be an entertainer. So I was like, okay, well, that's, that's, my, that's my dream. I want to be an entertainer. I want to be successful in being creative in that, in that, in that endeavor. Yeah, uh, right and before we, get, we discuss about that, I was thinking that if you wanted to concentrate, you know, like doing like music and you want to just, you know, do something on YouTube, where if you had the opportunity to, would you go with more in like in the direction of Brental Floss, like creating, you know, lyrics on music or maybe... Uh, playing music on the guitar or doing something similar to like Smooth McGroove in which he hums and does little boops to the music? Uh, how would you kind of do your own style of it? No, I, I feel like those two loves for me are, are uh, they're separate. I really like music. I really like video games. I do like video game music, but I also just really like 
you know, music. And I don't wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily need to have them uh, come together. Uh, certainly in the early days of Starship Amazing, um, it was very much inspired by video game music because that was kind of like what was interesting. Uh, that was an interesting kind of genre for me. And I feel like in the last, uh, you know, seven years since I've been doing this, I've kind of seen uh, chiptune music and nerdcore and those types of cover bands kind of, uh, they weren't, they're no longer just like kind of niche genre. They're like a very established genre that, um, you know, has, has many uh, talented people in it, many fans. And it's, it, it's, it guess it isn't really as interesting to me. But that, you know, that's, just, that's just me not to, to talk down to those people. But like, no, I never really had much interest uh, I will say that I, I taught myself how to play guitar and outside of like learning Metallica songs and Led Zeppelin songs, um, I actually would, would learn how to play Mega Man songs by ear, just the melodies there. And that was one way I taught myself how to play guitar. Oh, wow. So I, I think I kind of had that and it was such a personal thing that I just never really felt it was necessary to go about that route. And then I also found out working with Calvin, who's my, my cohort for Starship Amazing, that uh, I'm not really good at like performing music, like really playing it. Uh, I'm much better at just kind of composing it. And kind of one of the cheats of doing electronic music is you don't have to practice. You know, you, you, anyone can write a song, but then it takes you know real dedication, like a real musician, to sit there and actually like practice the damn thing and be able to play it with your fingers. Um, and that part was always more difficult for me. So when it was like I can just record these piano melodies in a computer and then fix them up, that made way more sense to me. Wow, that's really interesting because, you know, for a lot of people, you know, playing music is, um, it either could be really hard or it could be, like, just as simple as breathing. Like, I, I used to play the piano when I was very young and I did, like, the basic stuff, but then, you know, when I got off of it for a few years, uh, I'd pretty much forgotten the entire thing and I tried reteaching myself again and I feel like I play more to it by ear than by music sheets. I guess it depends on how you're learning, so I guess... Is it similar to you in which, um, you know, when you are off the groove for a couple of years for music, do, do you kind of like forget a little bit or do you, when you get back to it, it just becomes more natural? It's, uh, it's, I feel really kind of arrogant answering this question, but it's like when it comes to writing music, uh, it just comes really naturally to me, uh, like writing melodies and stuff, especially with Calvin, because he and I have been making music for, like, together so long that it's like, you know, we hang out sometimes, but often us making music is part of our friendship, part of hanging out. And so it really comes natural. Um, and I, I've actually been, uh, I, I've had myself a decent job these last couple of years with uh, actually able to have like medical uh, insurance and stuff like that, able to see a doctor. And um, I've actually been taking medication to curb my, uh, my ADD <laughs> and my dyslexia. And I found that for the longest time that uh, music, actually playing music, physically playing it, was actually a way for me to control my energy and to curb my, you know, my hyperactivity. And in the last year or so, I actually haven't been playing uh, guitar or piano, like, recreationally. I'll sit down and, like, write music and play music and that'll be fun. But I used to always have my guitar handy and I would pick it up and I would just start, you know, rocking out on something or play something. And I realized now that it was actually a form of uh, self-medication. Um, and that's one reason why that probably, uh, that always, <laughs> it was, uh, I drew, music drew itself to me, uh, or I was drawn to music, rather, uh, because it was, uh, there was something else going on at the surface there. Yeah, and also I think that when I listen to Starship Amazing, I always feel like there's a lot of energy in it. Like, regarding if it's like a really upbeat song or it's very mellow, I just feel like there's a lot of energy that you and Calvin put into it. And, uh, you know, definitely for the most part, I feel like if you have control of what you're trying to do, it's able to come out very smoothly and it's able to come out a lot more easier as opposed to somebody that who is like really hyped up and then eventually things start getting a little bit sloppy and a little bit disjointed. I've always liked uh, uh, emotion. Um... And uh, that's one thing, another reason why I really liked uh, metal for a while. I was really, really into to loud rock, lots of heavy stuff, because there was an emotion behind it. It wasn't necessarily a positive one, but that's always really spoke to me. And uh, I guess we just decided that we write, we, we are in our best when we write kind of more happy, pause vibes songs. And uh, so, you know, Calvin and I both, <laughs> uh, both have our dark moments and both get angry and cynical about things, but... I guess we just, we, you know, we try to choose uh, the more happy moments 
to uh, the ones to kind of put into uh, our music. And also, our music is kind of dancey, and so you need to have kind of an upbeat vibe to it. I think that that fits better. People want to dance and have fun, and that's, that's an easy place for me to, uh, to tap into. Uh, besides getting your influences, obviously, from James Rolfe, um, who else have you gotten inspiration what? from? No, I was... I'm, I'm totally original. What are you talking about? <laughs> who? Ne- never, never heard of him. What? Uh, I think he's uh, somewhere from Kentucky or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure I started before him. That must have been what happened. You can look at the YouTube dates. You see it clearly. <laughs> yeah. I'm totally joking. I, I know, I know. I'm freaking out. <laughs> I know. So, some people do get kind of crazy. That's Absolutely. okay. That's okay. <laughs> That's not a problem at all. <laughs> so, uh, who other internet personalities or just people in general have you gotten your influences from when starting off the Happy Video Game Nerd? Yeah, no, a lot, the, the idea definitely came from James, uh, and I think uh, what, he, what he did for that community was basically show that, um, you know, you can, like, make farcical, silly videos about video games. Uh, and he made it look so easy, and that's kind of one thing I've always really admired about James, is that uh, he's a filmmaker, s- small detail. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, the rest of us on YouTube, you know, way back in 2006 and 2007, uh, when we were all kind of getting started out, we were just a bunch of bunch of dorks with webcams. But, like, James had lights, and he had cameras, and he had software, and he knew how to cut a film and things like that. So he was he, he made it look really easy, and it's it's, you know, there's certainly a lot of work to it. Uh, so he, he kind of like a lot of people saw his videos and said, oh, I can do that too. And so I, I, that's where that started. Uh, I would say I got a lot of influence from, at the, at the time, uh, game trailers uh, used to have a, a, a series. They might still do, actually, uh, where uh, they used to do super long retrospectives. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they still kind of do retrospectives. Um, I think recently they started doing a, a new kind of retrospective series called Timeline, in which they're looking at a series in chronological order. They did one for Zelda, they did one for Kingdom Hearts, and coming up soon they should be doing one for the Metal Gear series. So. Oh, God, good luck with that. Wow. <laughs> I know, it's convoluted, it's crazy. But that, in uh, the summer of, I think it was the summer of 07, because uh, I, I finally pulled the trigger on the Happy Video Game Nerd in the fall of 07, uh, he started this, like, 15... Uh, I think Brandon Jones is the guy. Yes, Brandon Jones, yes. Yeah, started this 15-episode uh, retrospective on the Final Fantasy games. And I remember watching those and being like, wow, you, you can talk about video games for several, several minutes, you know, for 10, 20 minutes, uh, not just do jokes constantly, and keep it interesting and engaging. And that, that was kind of what I wanted to do. Um, there's there's cer- certainly nothing wrong with, you know, you know, looking at video games and making videos about them and kind of poking at, like, the ridiculous the ridiculous stuff you find in video games. Because video, video games are kind of dumb. And, you know, making jokes about them is, is totally fine. Uh, but I just never really thought of myself as that funny of a dude. Um, so I was like, I kind of want to do videos about video games that maybe be a little more professional about it or to maybe take them a little more serious and, you know, have a little more analysis and just kind of dig deeper on the, uh, uh, on the analysis. Like I, I saw that all the time for uh, cinema and, and literature and uh, music, and I saw that very seldom in video games. Um, you see it more and more, and I think it's great, and I think there's room for it, but I, I say he was also a really big influence, like a catalyst for like, okay, I, I can do this, and, you know, it, it's... It's crazy when I made my first Earthbound video. Uh, there's a 33-minute version of it that's on my YouTube channel. But a couple of years before that, I had made one that was like 20 minutes long. And I remember making writing the script out for that and sending it to my friend, uh, Ben, uh, who who's, was affiliated with uh, Retro RTV, and as was I at the time, and asking him, like, is this boring? Is this, like, too long? Is, this, like, is anyone going to want to listen to someone yammer on about a video game for like 20 minutes, and he's like, yeah, it's fine. And then I made it, and all, my, all the, the initial comments were like, that was great, you need to add this, need to add this, need to add... It wasn't long enough. All I heard was that, yo, it wasn't long enough, he didn't talk about this, he didn't talk about this. And it, it, that's kind of been reinforcing this idea that, like, okay, well, you can, you can talk as long as you want about anything, even video games, as long as you work hard to keep it engaging and interesting. Uh, so that was one. Of, that's what I wanted to do, and uh, that was a really big influence. And his and his work is is, is excellent. Uh, I, I'm blanking on it, but he also does like a, like like video game secrets. 
I totally forget what the, the name is, but uh, he'll, he'll they'll look at like urban legends for certain video games. This is another show on game trailers. Like they did one for like Golden Eye and talking about um, this you know, the Fire Temple in Ocarina of Time and those types of videos. Like that they're you know professional and they're serious and you know they're not full of jokes and stuff like. That. Yeah, I definitely agree. And one of my favorite series from game trailers, whom you know that's also a huge influence of mine. Uh, check out my top fifty influences uh, of online stuff. Um, I also really liked their pop facts and pop fiction in which... They, yeah, that's what it was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Pop facts and pop fiction in which, you know, they give you interesting facts. That's pop facts. Pop fiction is if there's, like, some sort of rumor that is going on, like, you know, why did they take off the original Fire Temple song in Ocarina of Time to is James McCloud connected to the F-Zero series? So... Yeah, that's a really interesting one, and I really like how they are able to delve deep into it. Uh, another person who you know I was influenced by uh, in my you know in my online stuff, I, I interviewed her last year, Lindsay Briggs, aka Little Miss Gamer, and I know that you briefly talked about her as well, right? I was right after I started doing the HVGN is when I got um, uh, hip to Captain S, and uh, yeah, my early days I used to I used to watch that and really think like, oh man, those guys, okay, that's the top. <laughs> this is the best <laughs> shit out there. I gotta I gotta try and. And then be as good as that, or uh, and yeah, I, I um, met them a couple times at uh, at festivals and stuff, and yeah, they were also a big influence to me. You started um, Retro Beats, and that's basically showcasing uh, music from video games that not a lot of people um, would know about um, if if they um, unless they actually played it or actually they heard about it. So, what made you getting insp inspired to create Retro Beats? I've always really liked video game music, and I've always thought that. And in, in, in to make a greater point of it, art, I think, is most interesting when there is limitation. Uh, there's many examples in any kind of medium where somebody is given all the time and money in the world to work on a project, and uh, that project ends up being just a, a disaster oftentimes. So um, there's always something to be said about, you know, the role of a director and a producer, you know, the creative person, and then also the guy pointing at the watch going, yo, we got this much time get this much money. I think that type of thing is really important to the creative process. And uh, when you think of music, I don't know that there's any other like medium of music in the modern era that was more limited than NES music and, and Super Nintendo music, but especially 8-bit music. And so in, in my mind, like, you know, some of the greatest melodies that have been written in our time are from video game music. And it has to do with the fact that it's so limited. There, there's so little of such a small palette you can work with. And so... I wanted to showcase that. And also, I've uh, always had this idea from like the remix, the video game remix community. Uh, what, it it, it seems, seems so banal to me. It seems like uh, it, it's a community that is seen solely interested in just like remixing you know, Super Metroid songs and Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger songs. And those soundtracks are excellent, uh, but I feel like there's so much better other music out there. And so it was my chance to be like, all right, I'm going to try and educate people. Uh, with uh, just you know, have you ever have you ever really sat down and listened to this weird game and this and its awesome soundtrack? And uh, that was kind of my goal. And also, uh, I'm not sure if it really shows, but there wasn't an, an, a, a lot of um, uh, mixing and mastering that I would do to each of the tracks to try and get them to sound bigger and brighter. Because you know, if you pull a song straight from an, a ROM or an NSF file. You know, it, this the sound is very sonically kind of muffled and boring, and so it was also an attempt to like understand, uh, you know, EQing and mastering and trying to do those engineering techniques, uh, which is something that we've experimented a lot with Starship Amazing, but always felt like it's like this, this strange black magic that's very difficult to figure out on your own. So it's also an excuse to try and mess around with, uh, uh, you know, mixing and mastering techniques. Uh, I was partially inspired by um, Retro Beats to start off my own little music podcast called Nick Jukebox over at my channel. Oh, right on. <laughs> yeah, uh, Nick Jukebox, um, for all you listeners out there who haven't heard it, it is a compilation of classic Nickelodeon songs from 1970s to the 2000s. And another partial inspiration was that I was just really furious on Nick Radio, which is on their official website, in which they just showcase the latest pop singers. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you trying to rip off Radio Disney now? I mean, why can't you just showcase the songs that used to play back then? And, you know, I try to find, like, little bits of music that, oh, you know, it came from this show, or, you know, surprisingly, 
um, you know, they might be giants featured in Kablam, and you know, maybe maybe not not a lot of people know about it. So I'd like to showcase that. And I didn't know that Nickelodeon went back to the seventies. I thought Nickelodeon was just kind of like a late eighties thing. Um, well, Nickelodeon technically started in nineteen seventy seven with the Pinwheel Network, and then in seventy nine they brand they rebranded itself to Nickelodeon when it started making a little bit more money, but it was still kind of like really low-budget programs with classic shows such as America Goes Bananas, Hocus Focus, and The Third Eye and stuff like that. Long story short, uh... Classics. Yeah. <laughs> Classics. I've never, never heard of any of those. Most people have, well, most likely never will hear of yeah. them unless, you know, they either grew up in Columbus, Ohio, or if they were hardcore Nick fans who researched this kind of stuff like me. But I digress. Um, what is the process of writing an episode and choosing which game you're going to feature and, um, you know, what style that you're going to present this at. And, you know, in recent, um, just recently, not too long ago, when you're doing Earth Defense Force 2017, you started delving a little bit more into, like, last generation games. Kind of, like, more open toward generations, especially more recent ones. James is kind of doing a little bit, and other people are kind of starting to do it a little bit. So what made you decide to do that um, in which you, you know, cover last gen games? Well, I've always wanted to buck trends. I've always... You know, a lot, a large part of the HVGM was also me looking at uh, this community of imitators that has sprouted up around James, and you know, I'm of course one of them. But I, I just found people were just taking the angry motif and then pushing that further, or doing their own spin on it. And I, you know, I, I kind of remember looking at it and going, "How come no one's just done the happy video game or done the opposite?" And so. I, I kind of kept that mentality with, like, let's do games that no one else has done. Like, I could, you know, review Super Mario Brothers 3 or Double Dragon, um, but I would rather do, like, Star Tropics or Metal Storm, uh, games that I think are really, really good and maybe not everyone talks about. So uh, I, I think it's just it, it, it's, it's, it's one thing to just try and be different because I also feel like the Internet as a whole, and not to just put that whole community... Uh, of imitators under the bus, but like kind of the internet as a whole um, is is very like regurgitating, very recycled. It's a, it's it's you know it's a, it seems, feels like there's a handful of creative people out there, uh, and then a bunch of people just kind of want to copy that. You look at like meme culture; I think it's just really banal. It just it really doesn't interest me. Um, and also, uh, I'm just some dude in a studio apartment in a one bedroom apartment in Anchorage, Alaska. I can't keep up with. Uh, these professional sites, these professional reviewers that are doing the new games and getting, uh, you know, get, going to conventions and going to shows and seeing them early and getting early access to I, I, I can't compete with people that are doing the modern stuff as it's coming out. It's difficult even just to keep up with it on my personal level, just to, to uh, you know, play everything as it comes out. So I kind of realize I'm going to have to do something different. And I, I want to do something different because I, I, I could try and go the professional route, but. You know, maybe one day, if that, if that, you know, if, if, if those, if that bridge happens, I might, I might cross it. But right now, I'm just some dude in an apartment, just you know, with a day job, just making videos for fun. I want to make them count. I want to try me something different, and so uh, that kind of means sticking with the retro stuff. That means trying to find underrated or forgotten stuff. And uh, on a on a personal note, the Earth Defense Force video was actually. Uh, one of the first videos I ever wanted to make, I, when I first started out, I was thinking, like, I'll stick with Nintendo and Super Nintendo, and then you work up to those other ones. So I, I would like to just one time do a, a 360 game. It'd be great to do EDF 2017. That was 2007, and uh, I was going through an old laptop, uh, and I had my, my first attempt at writing that script for uh, EDF 2017 actually started in early 2009. So I've been actually trying to review that game for, like, five years now. So it was actually just kind of cathartic for me to get it finished in the first place. But also, upon working uh, on that video, uh, I had to get a lot of footage, a lot of video game footage. Uh, that I, I, I even wish I could have gotten more for that, uh, for that video. And it actually ended up being an incredibly time-consuming process. So I, I'm... I kind of want to stick to games that are smaller and maybe shorter and, like, yeah, a lot of Nintendo games. There's a lot of really good Nintendo games I'd like to still review. And, hey, you can beat them in an hour or two hours. And it's like, oh, cool. So I can, like, in two hours 
get all the footage I'm going to need. That sounds great. So there's also a logistical thing of like, yeah, doing old school games would be so much easier on the production time. And I think so too, mostly because that, you know, times have changed when it came to games. Not like playing a game that's like one megabit big and the levels are really short, but it's really difficult as opposed to like you have this huge expansive world with a complex story and gameplay with um, difficulty spikes at times or... Um, having to go through tutorials and stuff. So, yeah, it's really different nowadays, especially, you know, in some videos that you talk about the story in which sometimes the story is important, sometimes the story is not important. I guess for some people, they say that the story is what really matters in a game. Others say that um, I just skipped the story. I mean, if you have you ever seen Did You Know Gaming, by the way? Yeah. Um, do, you have, do you remember the Doom episode in which uh, they were discussing about an interview that John Carmack did regarding about stories and games in which he kind of sees it as a triple X movie? They're expected to be there, but it's not that important. What are your opinions on the story? Uh, definitely, I, I can understand um, the people that made Doom having that opinion. Uh, if, if I recall, there was even, um, I, I forget, he, he actually went on to do other games. I forget his name, but uh, there was a... One person from ID who left the project kind of early uh, helped make Doom wanted to have a bigger story and even like an introductory like cinema and like, you know, an, an introductory like level uh, that all that got cut way, way early on. Um, and a game like Doom doesn't really need a whole lot of story and, that, and that's fine. And same with a game like Quake, uh, very simple stories and you don't need a whole lot to them. And not all games need that. Uh, but I think it's kind of an old school way of thinking is in that, like, especially in like the NES days and Super Nintendo days, like you didn't really need to have story and it was worth skipping. It was worth like glossing over, but you know, you have like Mass Effect and, and Skyrim and then those types of games that uh, have incredible story and you be, that, that's half the reason to play them. Uh, I remember uh, there was when um, Bioshock Infinite came out, uh, there was a really good piece that somebody had written uh, but it was a really good point, and it got a lot of uh, 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 a lot of umbrage towards. Um, he wanted to play the game without any of the shooting, any of the violence, and just wanted to enjoy the story. And I think for you know 2012 when that game came out, that was kind of a novel idea. That was kind of an interesting idea because Bioshock Infinite it does have what I think is an, is an amazing story, and uh, I, I, people have disagreed with me. But I would say that it's it almost completely makes sense, and it's a pretty tight story. Um, but the idea of, yeah, just experiencing that story without having to worry about the gunplay and the violence and stuff like that, that's kind of a novel concept. And I, I certainly have no problem with games like Gone Home um, uh, or like the, the Walking Dead and stuff like that that are largely just stories. Uh, I, don't, I, I think the medium of video games is so broad that you could have, we can have a game like Doom or Serious Sam or whatever you know, modern analog you want to uh, conjure. And, and we can also have these games that are like just stories, like you're just walking around a house and putting together pieces of a puzzle. Um, I think there's room in this, in this industry for that. I, I think I also like that's a really interesting way to tell a story because, you know, there's that passiveness of watching a film or a television show and just sitting on a couch and watching characters. It's, it's a different motivation. It's a different vibe. It's a different feeling when, you know, even if you are just like walking down what is essentially an alleyway and you're reading or it's, you're just kind of turning pages in a book, still having that visceral control of the character, it does change uh, the experience. And I think that's kind of one of the great things about video games. I definitely agree, especially with, uh, you know, a lot of people are comparing it to, like, you're watching a movie. In fact, I had a friend of mine who was playing Uncharted 2, and there was, like, a group of people who were watching, and it's like, they want to know what happens next, and then when he died, it's like, hey, what just happened? It's like, oh, I just died. It's like, wait, that's a game? You're not, that's not a movie? It's like, no. <laughs> it's like, what? It's like, crazy. Well, but that also touches on another subject of, in the last couple of years, like, Twitch has become an enormous, uh, an, an enormous thing. And even though a lot of people look at Let's Plays as kind of this recent, uh, this recent thing, it's like, oh, now, now we just watch people play video games. It's like, I remember back in like the 2008, 2009 days uh, when people would just like, they would put Call of Duty videos. That was like some of the biggest stuff out there was uh, somebody recorded this five-minute video of them getting this awesome kill streak in Call of Duty. 
And I remember thinking at that, just scratching my head, like, who wants to watch this? But I would look at the uh, uh, the charts, you know, there those back in those days, you know, a little guy like me could actually like be number, you know, 19 most watched for the day or, you know, number two most watched for the week or whatever. Actually, I never got the number two, but still, you could look at the, uh, you could just look at what like, you know, the Billboard charts, most popular videos in gaming were. And the majority of them were just you playing Call of Duty, just like five, ten minute videos he'll play in Call of Duty and it's so that's that's kind of always been a thing it's just now there is a market that surrounds it uh, and also you look at Minecraft half of the reason that that game is so successful is because uh, I believe Notch almost right away uh, was very vocal about like if you want to let's play our game go for it I don't care and, you know we, we, we will never take anyone's video down because you're playing our game we want you to and that was a, that's a huge thing because then People know about this game through watching other people play. It's like kind of free advertisement. Uh, so that's another, again, watching even just the internet evolve. I've, I've been able to watch uh, video games kind of evolve into what it is now. Also, you know, I'm old enough to have not had the internet for my childhood. And then my teenage years got the internet. And then my 20s was all the internet. So even watching that shift and change has been an interesting journey. I know that wasn't what you were asking, but that's no, no, it's, it's, that. no, no. It's great. It's great. I, I that's a really, really in depth um, answer. I really enjoyed it. Not only do you do music and re- doing game reviews, but you also, you know, from time to time, do skits uh, alongside with your friends. <laughs> uh, you know, some you know involving with uh, uh, Peter and Dana, others involving with Seth and. Um, Calvin, what made you decide to do like skits from time to time? Is it to you know to shake things up from time to time? You know, it's like you do your reviews or you do your music, and then you just want to have some fun with your friends, or it's just another interest that you have. You know, I kind of all that I've learned about filmmaking, I've learned from doing HBGN, but it still doesn't feel like it's like traditional film. So it's almost like yeah, let's give this a shot. But it's uh, I, I did April Fool's Day video this year where I, I did like a, a, t- a top 10 video, uh, which, I, which I, I really don't like top 10 videos, but I made a spoofy uh, top 10 video. And it was actually kind of nice, if from a creative standpoint, to step away from like reviews. Uh, and to, it's a completely different mindset. It's a completely different, you know, in the writing and the production and the editing. It's all it's such a completely different uh, m- mindset. So it, it was kind of nice to do. I would like to do more of them to break up the monotony of uh, just reviewing games. I really do like doing them, but that's also why I, I would do retro beats and I would do, uh, is it really that bad? And I love doing the streams. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's a different outlet. It, it is, it's a take a break from these reviews because they, uh, they're a lot of work. I don't mean to sound whiny, but you know, I, I put a lot of uh, time and effort in these videos and uh, it's nice to take a break every once in a while. And I would like to actually um, make more skit videos, but there's only so many hours in the day. Right, and everybody has their own schedules to, um, you know, to do, you know, have their own lives to do as well. Yeah. So everybody's really busy to do, you know, what they need to do. So I can't wait to see another one of your skits. Uh, that would be really great. I, I want to know a lot more about Dr. Cuddles. <laughs> oh, I'm... gosh, that's right. Those those skits, I, I can uh, address those specifically, like uh, the Peter Dana Derrick sketches. Uh, that was kind of a one-off thing that, that we, were, we, were, did, we did for a bit. And uh, it, it, we we did two skits, and we actually uh, we, we shot and we shot three of them, uh, but that, that first one didn't turn out so well. Then we did the other two, and it didn't quite work out. That you know, the, the we made them, and we were going to make a fourth one. And I recall talking to Peter and just being like, I, he 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 was kind of the main writer of that uh, of the of the troupe, and he came to me with this script. Um, and I was like, I don't know what the hell this is, dude. I don't know what you're trying to do with this. Like, I don't know. Why. I, 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 I read it. And I was like, I know you're proud of this, but I don't know what this is. I don't know. It, it was such a strange skit. And then he ended up doing it, it uh, on his own time. And it just didn't work out, unfortunately. Uh, so, but outside of that, um, yeah, more skits. Yeah, definitely. More skits. Mm-hmm. Put that on your must-do for 2015 thing. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I actually... Um, my 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 uh I have I guess I can say I have like a a producer now. Oh, cool! And uh, and a and a uh, you know a, a cinematographer. They 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 help me actually shoot the the last three videos, especially the clock tower one. And we're both uh, really happy with how that turned out because 
Uh, we spent a long time trying to get the lighting and trying to get the uh, the live action stuff to look good, uh, except for a couple of things. We were really happy with how it turned out. And they're like, yeah, we should do more skits and more type of things like that. And uh, so it's, it's good to have that creative mind also, because I'm kind of just like, no, nah, reviews, reviews. I'm kind of stay focused on that and maybe have a fleeting idea. But then I can kind of walk to them and say, hey, I have an idea for something stupid. I don't know. Here, think on that. Uh, so it's possible. But they have day jobs too. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, you know, take your time on the skits. I'm sure it'll turn out really well, or crazy, or weird, or however it turns out. But I'm sure it'll be really enjoyable. It, it, the reaction to the uh, the top ten epic NES boobs oh. video uh, was really was really entertaining to me because uh, a lot of people really hated it for the right reason, loved it for the wrong reason. Uh, a friend of mine who's actually a much bigger YouTube star, <laughs> um, uh, he's, he's a, bit, a buddy of mine, and I, I, uh, he, he, he found it a couple months after the fact. He was like, oh, my God, do you need to make more of these? Can this be, like, a super cynical and just, like, pessimistic, <laughs> like, show? It's like, I don't know, man. Uh, but it, it, the reaction of that was, was, I think, alarming in that, like, I don't think people realize that I kind of have this sort of darker edge to myself. So I think it was it was fun to do that skit only because people were like, "Well, oh, Derek Alexander made this." Not everybody, but a handful of people were kind of like, "Like, did what? Like, they would have never thought that I would have made something like that," which was kind of funny. Uh, their perception of me is different than how I see myself, which, which is a, which is of course uh, to be expected, but kind of an interesting thing to be confronted with uh, by reading the comments on that video. And so. Yeah, skits. I'll stop talking about skits now. Okay. Uh, let's move on to another topic, which um, you know I'm actually a huge fan of as well as Mega Man. I, I just wanted to know um, two things. Now, you always talk about that, you know, you like the first three Mega Man, the classic ones, but you didn't really care for the last ones. And which Mega Man game is, your, is in your opinion, very underrated? And if you could make, you know, a, a, a fan game of Mega Man, like, you know, either the classic or the X or... Um, whatever. Um, how would you design it? I, my my relationship with Mega Man is really odd, in so much that I like only a handful of the Mega Man games, but the ones that I do, I really really like. And you know, when you look at Mega Man's batting average, like you know, it's not it's not good. It's not a good average. Most Mega Man games, when you kind of look at the majority, like they're they're all either average or some of them just are just bad. Um. I would really, really like to see a Mega Man Legends 3, or at least a remake of Mega Man Legends 1. Uh, I don't know that that game is underrated, but that game is does some really, really interesting and cool things. And it's just, it's hamstrung by the fact that it's on a PlayStation 1 in a time before dual joysticks. And just that that game, it, it functions well enough, but the combat's just kind of clunky. Uh, I really like the art style, but it would benefit from... Uh, some modern video games, some modern systems. I kind of feel like all the Mega Man games are kind of solidly rated. And the reason why there are so many Mega Man games is because every so often they really nail one. That's just, they just knock it out of the park. It's just so damn good. And they're so, so good that they can even sustain that spin off or even the whole franchise for, you know, a few more sequels. I have a good friend uh, who is a Let's Player on YouTube called Gemini Laser, who does, like, um, walkthroughs slash show-off videos of the classic Mega Man series, and he's, you know, does an amazing job, and, you know, there's some points in which he complains about, oh, you know, there should have been a trap here, or, oh, there should have been, like, an enemy here, because this part is too easy. Now, um, if you were to, you know, create your own version, um, how would you design it? Well, okay, first off, like, I don't make games, so... Like just get, I'm, I'm. This is for my armchair, my comfy armchair here. Well, uh, he doesn't really uh, make games either, but he knows somebody who does. So if you were to know somebody who does, or if, oh. so, um, how would you design it? All right, so I'm a, I'm an eccentric billionaire, and I've got I, I can fund my own Mega Man game. All right, uh, I think what I would I would go back and fix Mega Man Four, and I I I know a lot of people like Mega Man Four, and I always get a lot of crap when I bring this up. I hate Mega Man. 4. I just, I, 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 I can't divorce myself from this was the follow-up to Mega Man 3, which is tied with Mega Man 2 as my favorite game of all time. I can't decide between the two. I could tell you, I could go on for, for like 20 minutes on why 
Mega Man's 2 and 3 are my favorite games of all time. But Mega Man 4, to me, that was kind of when the series started to really just get boring and redundant. And first off, you have levels that... You have, like, bosses that are not very original. And they were running out of um, ideas for it, but I think they kind of had their heads in the wrong place with the uh, Robot Masters is you have to have the snow boss, and you have to have, you know, the fire boss, and you have to have a water boss, or something like that. And the, I think when you do that, you're also stuck with, well, Charge Man has to have a train, and his, and his, geez, it, the level has to be a train. And one thing I liked about, say, Gemini Man, was, like, the only thing about Gemini Man that's even Gemini is that there's two of them when you fight for the first half of the battle. The rest of it's just kind of like this neon world where there's water and penguins and stuff like that. It's weird stuff. Um, and though it doesn't really fit to a specific vibe, it was still like a good it was, it was a good level. It was an interesting level with a good song. And too often they kind of feel like they have to match that vibe. It has to be like an element or it has to be some kind of specific thing. So I would say just try and make generic Mega Man bosses or like, you know, do Mega Man bosses that don't have any really big defining characteristic about themselves. Uh, then that allows you to just make interesting levels. And then uh, that also allows you to make the music a little more interesting. That's another thing that I feel like kind of it, it kind of would hinder them and it kind of put them in a corner. It's like, okay, we have to have the music kind of fit this vibe. And I, I need to really get away from that. And one thing that's always bugged me is in Mega Man 3, when you beat the Robot Masters, before you go to the Mega Man, or sorry, the Wily levels, you go back to four of the stages. And you go back to them again, and they're harder this time. And you fight uh, two boss battles with the two Robot Masters from the previous game. So you actually are fighting Robot Masters from Mega Man 2 and Mega Man 3 in, in you know, charted up difficult levels of Mega Man 3. It's, it's, it's difficult to kind of put into words there, but I always thought that was a super, super interesting mechanic in a way to really kind of acknowledge, like, yeah, there's a billion games here. We have an enormous universe you can pull from. Uh, and I believe, was it Mega Man 4 or was it the 5 that had, like, Dr. Ka- Cossack? Uh, that would be, the, be the fourth one. Yeah, where it, had, it basically was like, we just, instead of doing levels again and trying, you know, taking the uh, older levels and making them kind of more difficult, we just made another Wily level, mm-hmm. which... That didn't feel like the right move to me. So I, I, I love going back to the older games. That's such a, such a cool uh, thing. And it, 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 it always baffled me that they never did that for any of the other ones. So that's something else that I would do to, to make it more difficult and kind of make things a little longer. I guess, yeah, if, if I had my druthers, that's how I would uh, pitch a new Mega Man game. And then really just kind of stick, oh, get rid of the charge beam. Uh, that just ruins the balance of the game. Yeah, I just, I, 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 that, my, that is true, yeah. And 5, it was worse. Mm-hmm. I would say 5 is an improvement over 4. I mean, um, well, the charge beam was a little bit too overpowered. It made practically every single weapon useless. Yeah, it, it's the problem with that is then you don't have to balance... Um, then you, you don't have to balance the boss fights. I feel like uh, one thing I liked about Mega Man 9 was it was tough, but every single boss battle and every single level... Uh, was doable with just the uh, Mega Buster, just a normal shot. And that's kind of how the game should be. Because when you have the charge shot, then all of a sudden every single boss can be defeated with just like seven, eight well-placed charge shots. And it, it just kind of takes away any kind of difficulty. Um, and it's kind of lazy. But I guess balancing all that stuff is very difficult. It takes a lot of work. That is true. I don't mind the slide. Um, I like the slide. Uh, I don't know that Mega Man needs to not know how to duck anymore. I think it'd be cool if you could finally duck. Yeah. That seems to work in most every other side-scrolling action platformer. Uh, but that would be about it. But I guess I, I, I don't think much about that because there's a lot of Mega Man games out there, and the ones that I really, really like are still good. And I guess I'm not the type of person who's like, who really wishes a game would, would come out. I, I'm kind of, there are lots of games I wish we would, would be remade or that would... Um, Get a, get a proper sequel finally. But also, like, yeah, there's other games out there. I, I guess I don't dwell too much on uh, franchises, even though I'm a big fan of certain franchises. Like, there's other games out there. Yeah, definitely. And um, in your opinion, you know, when you're discussing about, like, a, um, a game that you really, really like and you, you are, you know, hoping that a remake would come out, um, are there any others that, you know, that you want to see remade? Because, you know, so far, um, you did a Splatterhouse review, there was a remake <laughs> of that. 
You talked about Rocket Knight. There was a remake on that. But yeah, it, so far, you know, you discussed about, you know, remakes on this, you know, Mega Man 9 and 10. So even though that's more like sequels, but, you know, it's still a continuation after like so many years with no nothing. But yeah, uh, which others um, would you like to see remade or maybe a little bit inspired by, you know, with indie games becoming really popular nowadays? You know, I get the sense that, like, more and more, if you look for it, you, f you find, the, like, like the sequel to the game we never got. Like, as much as I love Resident Evil 4, the game is, that game is kind of clunky. It's, it, it is a little hard to go back to. I feel like Dead Space is kind of like that proper sequel we never got. And I'm playing through, uh, I just rented Alien Isolation, and a friend of mine uh, put this thought in my head, and, and so far I'm kind of feeling that vibe, is that... I didn't like Dead Space 2. It was, a, it was a fine game, but they pushed it more into like a straight third-person action game. It wasn't kind of a backtracking, environmental-heavy uh, uh, kind of survival horror game. It was just kind of like walking down you know, a corridor. It just didn't feel like the game fit for me. But like Alien Isolation kind of feels like that proper sequel we never got. And so there are a handful of games, and whenever I get this question, I, my mind blanks immediately. I'm sure there's a handful that I would like to see. But I can't think of any right now. But there are games that will take inspiration from older games and you know move forward on that idea and, and ideally uh, expand on it. So there are some games out there that you can look at as like this is kind of like the sequel that I always wanted but never got. But I would love to see a remake or just some kind of re-release of Ill Bleed that comes to mind right away. Just because I want more people to play that game because I feel like games that are just super weird and dumb. And just really just 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 have a jo joyous existence of being stupid and having fun. Uh, that's one of the most gleefully enjoyable games I've ever played, and I wish I wish it was easier for people to play it. Now that's actually a really interesting thing. Uh, I want to switch over to this question. Um, you know, there, when you're t discussing about oh, you know, well, you should play a game that uh, you know, like Metal Storm or Illbleed because you know it's a r it's really fun and probably most likely they never heard of it. Well, nowadays it seems like you know, the underrated gems are starting to get more popularity. Like, you know, I started seeing more recently that, you know, Metal Storm is getting a little bit of a huger fa following, and so is Wild Guns and uh, the Rocket Knight games. So I was thinking, um, do you feel proud that more people are, um, you know, noticing those kind of gems, but in a point in which they're no longer gems, they're kind of like in the mainstream? Or do you feel like, oh man, now more people know about this? I mean, I remember when this was like unknown, you know, because a lot of people who used to watch the Scott Pilgrim movies uh, when it first came out in theaters, and nobody knew about it, but now pretty much anybody who's a gamer knows about it. And then it's like, you know, the kind of like the quote unquote cult following novelty is sort of gone. Um, so um, what are your opinions on it? I've always kind of resented the, I liked it before it was cool, and now other people like it, and I don't think it's cool anymore. I've always been really sincere about, like, have, oh, you haven't heard of this game? You need to play it. Like, I really, I, I do want more people to know about certain games. Um, and it is super flattering, but not at all true, ever, when people say, like, oh, they remade this game. They were watching your video, Derek. Like, thanks. I'm glad you think I have that power. Like, I don't. <laughs> but that's super flattering you think that. Um... I, I, I never really look at anything, like, the media I consume, I don't think, like, identifies me as a person so much. And I think it, it comes from, like, oh, this band is my life, or the, the, this movie, this uh, comic book series, these video games, these are my life. And, I, and I'm like, no, these are things I really, really like, and I have a lot of passion, and I, I enjoy them, but, like, I don't think of myself as, like, it isn't so important to me that, uh, Ill Bleed is my game, you know, or something like that. Uh, it isn't important to me that, like, you know, Rocket Knight Adventures, that was for me. I wouldn't have made a video about it. I, I mean, I make these videos uh, with kind of the linchpin is I want more people to know about these games. I want people to play them. That might make them more expensive, and I'm, I'm sorry if, if I contributed all to that, but... Uh, no, I don't agree. Even when I, you know, I, I used to listen to a lot of music when I was a, a DJ for uh, my, my college. And even then, I, I always kind of was surrounded by people who were like, oh, have you heard of this band? Oh, they, they're all popular now. They're not very good anymore. And it's like, you know, maybe their newer record isn't very good because they, you know, are on a major label now. But that doesn't make their, that doesn't diminish the, of the impact of their previous records, you know, the stuff that you really, really liked and originally the reason why you got into that band, you know, so 
Um, I don't at all agree to that. I know a lot of people think I, I've been called a hipster uh, because I try to stay unknown and underground. Uh, and I suppose that's valid, but I, I don't do it through some kind of uh, nose in the air arrogance way. Uh, I, I hope it comes across that I genuinely want people to play, you know, a game like Illbleed because it's it's amazing. I, I know what you're coming at because you know when uh, various shows on DVD started coming out, like you know for Rocco's Modern Life back then when it was known as a cult classic, and now everybody knows about it. It's like, oh, and I heard actually you know somebody on the forums posting like you know I remember when this show came out as a, when I was a kid and I was the only person who knew about it. Now everybody knows about it. It's like at least be thankful that, you know, the DVDs for it has come out. If it was like a, a show that nobody knew about, let's just say, you know, I don't know, Space Cases, then of course that show's going to be kind of like shifted and forgotten. At least it's breathing new life to people. You should be a little bit more appreciative of it. But to be quite honest, I, I really couldn't care less. I have uh, a few more questions uh, right before we conclude. Uh, one of my friends uh, who's actually a huge fan of yours, Jim B., he's wondering about what is your opinion on dubstep? Hey, Jim, I don't like dubstep. Okay. Uh, I, I, the longer answer to that is, all right, dubstep is, is, it's, is dumb, and it's, it can be fun in that regard. Uh, I, don't, I don't really look at it more of just like, uh, you know, my girlfriend really likes dubstep, actually, and she'll put on some dubstep mixes, and I'm like, yeah, okay, this is good background music, but I don't see it as like a very serious uh, progression. It could have been, but it feels like it's a cul-de-sac in that, you hear one dubstep song, I feel like you've heard them all. So to me, uh, it was a dubstep I was kind of into it for like a month maybe. Uh, I downloaded a couple of big long mixes from a couple of podcasts and stuff like that. And I kind of had this realization like, yeah, a dubstep, like there's a, there's a rule book. It's like a guidelines. It's like step one, two, three, four. Th this is how you make a dubstep song. And like, it feels like everybody just kind of follows that. And so I, dubstep just got really kind of boring to me i think you can take dubstep and move, move it on to something more interesting i think trap music uh is a little more interesting and kind of using dubstep synths and dubstep sounds and you know the classic rave and house style of a, a build up and then a drop and things like that but i feel like dubstep is is it's a very one note singular kind of music that is all about it's all about the drop it's all about you know, that minute, 30 seconds build up to when the robot starts farting. And that's like every single song. Um, and I also feel like you can have a, your, your cool synth line. So you sound like a cool uh, house song and then you just stop your cool melody and you have the robot fart for 45 seconds and you just abruptly cut back to your melody. And I'm like, Oh, you just, I, I kind of feel like you've this genre of music has, has etched itself out that it doesn't need to worry about like song progression and how a song needs to flow. By its very definition, it's very abrupt and hard. That it's like I also feel like some people you just found an excuse to not have to worry about how your song needs to flow, and it, it, it's it's jarring for kind of a, the wrong reason. And uh, I, I, I it's really not for me. Okay. Um, all right, Jim, I hope that you enjoyed the answer, which most likely yeah. I'm sure he does because I don't know if he's a fan either. But um, one final question right before we conclude is if you were to, you know, looking back on, um, you know, when you first started seven years ago um, and, you know, thinking about the future, you know, what it is now, uh, you know, what's going on with uh, you getting your fan bases for your podcasts and your live streams and your music and your reviews... If you were to go back, you know, you know, when you first started off your Metal Storm review, you know, what would, you know, what what advice would you give to yourself? I guess I don't really think much about that. I, I look at my older videos, and even though they're, you know, patently terrible, um, I can watch them and go like, you know what, I I, I see myself giving it a hundred percent, even though I, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but I really was, I, I had that passion. I was really, really trying. And I feel like I would I just remind myself like, Hey, you know what, kid, your first few videos, uh, they're going to suck, but you just need to fail until you get good. You know, they, they, they say, you know, when you play chess or go, you know, they say, maybe you lose your first thousand games quickly. It takes time. The first thing you make is always going to suck. But you need to get that crap out so then you can make your good stuff. And 
I guess I don't really think about my past quite that much. It is what it is. I'm not going to spill all the beans here, but like I'm going to make some big changes here and I'm not going to ever have to, I'm not going to try and hide my past. I'm always just going to be like, yeah, that, those are videos I made seven years ago. Um, they are what they are and uh, I can't change that, but I guess I'm, I'm proud of them and I'm just going to keep my head to the grindstone and keep looking forward and just not dwell on the past too much. That's a really strong answer. Um, now, what I can give a, I can give a crappier one if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the, the one that you gave is just fine. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that is. Uh, I guess I can. We can conclude this episode of Casual Chats. Do you have anything to plug or self promote right before we go? Oh, um, gosh, you know, I, uh, I, I, I can just say one thing. You know, you have to be crazy to want to continue doing videos. Like, reviewing video games and being on the internet like I have been for seven years now. Um, and, you know, I've been doing these now for so long and trying to balance these videos with my life, <laughs> with real life stuff, uh, has been a consistent challenge, but a very fun and interesting one. And even though, like, just recently I got back to making videos again after, a, you know, a long, very long kind of hiatus, and I hope to keep going with these videos and not have to get into another hiatus, but, you know, knock on wood, um, it's yeah. really gratifying to come back after, you know, so many months and still have people care and still have people that watch and are excited and say nice things. Um, so I, I'm going to keep trying to keep making it interesting. Uh, we do, uh, Space Money Octagon does streams. We used to do them every Monday night. We we're going to, we just started doing them Wednesday nights. Uh, so every Wednesday night at seven, sorry, eight p.m. Uh, Pacific time, which is seven p.m. Alaska time, uh, we play video games and we have fun. So check us out on uh, Twitch.tv/slash Space Money Octagon. Uh, Stop Skeletons is a uh, is a podcast I do with my friend Jeff. We talk about video games. That's at Stop Skeletons. Uh, Tumblr. Com. That'll be uh, hopefully at iTunes by the time you hear this. And then just check out uh, Happy Video Game Nerd on YouTube and uh, check me out on Twitter, twitter.com slash Derek Alexander. And I got some crazy stuff coming up, so hopefully it uh, be interesting for you. All right, sounds great. And that concludes this episode of Casual Chats. Uh, Derek, once again, thank you so much for your coming and joining us. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And uh, hope that you enjoyed this episode of Casual Chats, and we will hope to see you in the next one. So take care. Bye, everybody.